Welcome to uh, Fearless JVM Lambdas. Uh, just to clarify, I'm talking about AWS Lambdas uh, in this case. Um, my name is John Chapin. I uh, just started a consultancy called Symphonia with, uh, with a colleague and good friend, Mike Roberts. And uh, we're focused on serverless and cloud tech, so that's, that's one reason we're talking about, uh, about Lambdas today. We're also, we've been closurists for five or six years now. Um, so that's, that's sort of where these, these two topics uh, intersect. Um, just a quick uh, little bit about us. So like I said, we're a serverless and cloud tech consultancy based in New York, uh, doing everything from strategy all the way down to sitting and pairing and bootstrapping teams. Um, we're giving a couple of workshops that are coming up, uh, one at OSCON, uh, that's a half day, and one at QCon in New York, uh, that's gonna be a full day. And those are just gonna be around building uh, scalable service, uh, serverless applications. Um, we're, we're gonna be using the JVM, I think Java for both, both, uh, both of those. Uh, and then we have a report coming out with O'Reilly soon uh, titled, What is Serverless? So uh, feel free to look for us there. And we've got a pretty uh, regularly updated blog and uh, you can grab us on Twitter as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to plug real quick, uh, since we're here in Portland, um, is that we're actually uh, really happy to be sponsoring the Right Speak Code Conference for 2017. Uh, so that's a four-day conference for women and non-binary software developers. Uh, it's August 23rd through 26th, uh, right here in Portland. Uh, the CFP uh, is open through April 23rd, and you can uh, find them on the web there. So I encourage uh, anyone who's interested, to spread the word or put in a, uh, a uh, proposal. So cool. So getting back to uh, JVM Lambdas. So here's the, here are the burning questions we're going to try to answer uh, in, in today's talk. Um, we're going to start really high level. So what is serverless? Um, and then we're going to discuss some use cases, good, you know, both good use cases and bad. Um, then we're going to go deeper. What is AWS Lambda? How does that work? How does that work with the JVM? Um, and then one more step. How do we write good, rather great, uh, AWS Lambdas using Clojure on the JVM? Uh, and then we're going to answer this last question here. You know, so we have this kind of uh, uh, this nice choice uh, that not a lot of other uh, you know, uh, programming communities have when working with a platform like AWS Lambda. We actually get to choose between the JVM or the Node.js runtime. And I'll go into a lot more detail uh, on that. So those are the questions we're going to try to answer. This is the agenda that's going to kind of cover that. If we have some time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about logging and metrics, but those, uh, we'll see if we get there or not. So cool. And uh, please hold uh, questions till the end, and I'll stick around here, and I'll be at the unsessions tonight, and feel free to grab me wherever you see me in the conference. So cool. So let's get started. So what is serverless? Um, Yes, there are servers. Uh, the, the, the point here is that we as users of, uh, of these platforms and user, users of these services um, aren't messing around with, with uh, individual servers. So can I get a show of hands real quick? Who is on the public cloud right now? Who's using the public cloud, AWS or? So, okay, so almost everyone. Um, there are some reasons not to, but most of us are, most of us are on pub, uh, public cloud. So these. These are sort of benefits of, of, of serverless, and these are gonna echo a lot of those benefits. Why we moved to the public cloud in the first place, which was to reduce labor costs, reduce risk, resource costs, drastically increase our flexibility of scaling. Um, but the thing that, that we're excited about uh, at, at Symphonia, and just that I'm excited about whenever I talk to anybody about this, is shortening lead time. So that's uh, the time between conceiving of, of an idea and being able to push it to production and try it out and get feedback you know, from your customers or whoever uh, and, and, and keep cycling on that. So shorter lead time is really the thing that, uh, that excites us. The tech is interesting, the cost savings are interesting, but it's helping teams move really fast. Uh, that's really the cool part, really where we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of benefit. Uh, and my partner, Mike, um, Mike Roberts, so he wrote an article on serverless architectures. I'll have the URL at the end. It goes into a ton of detail on these benefits, and we're gonna cover a lot of those things in that O'Reilly report uh, as well. So but let's move on. So what are traits of serverless, either systems or components? So these are some of the traits. Uh, the costs are based on precise usage. So if you're not using one of these things, like if you're not using Lambda, you're not paying anything for it. So compare that with EC2, where if you wanna have an EC2 instance idle, you're still paying for it, right? Um, the provisioning is based on usage, not instances. So what that means is that uh, instead of like, you know, taking DynamoDB, for example, instead of saying I want 10 machines worth of DynamoDB to handle whatever my load is, I say, well, I want to make this many uh, requests. I want to read and write this much data to DynamoDB, right? 
Um, so there are no long-lived, you know, uh, trait. Or sorry, no long-lived host or application instances. So we're never dealing with uh, something that's got to be kept alive or, or, or uh, you know, that looks like a a machine. Um, these services and systems are self-auto-scaling and auto-provisioning in in most cases. Uh, so what that means is that as the load increases, they auto-scale to meet that load. Uh, and they all have uh, high, uh, implicit high availability. And what I mean by that is that we're not concerned if an individual host or instance or process that's behind that service or that platform goes down. Somebody else is managing that for us. Somebody else is on the pager for that. Uh, in our case, the service, uh, we, we still use it as normal, and maybe we get a, you know, a transient error or something like that that we do have to deal with. But um, So anyway, so these are, some of the, these are the traits and some benefits of serverless. I'm going to talk about how we divide up the sort of serverless technology world into two areas. And so the first of those, and again, uh, Mike goes into a ton of detail uh, on this in his, uh, in his article, but the first uh, of those areas is called backend as a service. So these are generic hosted application components that we bundle into our own apps. Uh, and so examples of that are things like Firebase. Uh, if anybody used Parse, uh, that was a popular one uh, a couple of years ago. People doing like uh, backends for mobile apps would use, would use uh, Parse. Unfortunately, it's gone now. Uh, things like Cognito and Auth0. So another question we like to ask is, is how many people have written their own uh, logic to deal with users, to deal with you know, signing up or authenticating users, right? All of us have done that. And was it different the second time or the third time you did it? Probably not. So that's sort of a commodity thing that these, uh, these services cover. So these all have those traits that we mentioned in the, pre in the, in the previous slide. Um, and so that makes up sort of one area of what we like to call serverless. Now the other area, and the one that's going to seem more familiar and that's sort of the subject of today's talk, is functions as a service. And so these are, these are platforms where you just take a little bit of code, you ship it to that platform, and it gets run in response to events or in response to API calls. Um, the platform and the runtime are managed. And some examples of this, we're going to go into AWS Lambda in detail. Other examples, Microsoft Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions, which is now uh, out of alpha into beta uh, as of uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, OpenWhisk, uh, Auth0 has one called WebTask. Um, uh, some of the folks, it's not Trello, but the other company um, associated with Trello just put one out as well. Um, anyway, so th this is the other sort of large technical area. So there's backends as a service and functions as a service. Um, so let's talk about, we talked about some of the benefits Let's just touch on the challenges, and there's plenty of challenges to this stuff as well. It's not a panacea, it's not a magic bullet for anything, and I don't wanna try to give you that impression. Um, so when you have these, these little ephemeral components or these, these ephemeral um, you know, things sort of uh, that you're dealing with, state is a, is a, is a big uh, challenge. So fortunately, as closure programmers, we're used to uh, the this, this sort of trade-offs you make when, you, when you're dealing with state. And so an example we like to bring up is like the, the Heroku 12-factor model where you offload state from your processes, right? So if you have state in a process, you push it out to a database or something like that, and you sort of count on this ability to be able to kill a process or bring it back up um, you know, sort of whenever you like. Um, Latency is another huge challenge of this. So when you have all these little components, and this is similar, if you're running a microservices architecture or something like that, you have the same problem, right? Lots of these little components talking to each other over networks or over message buses, and all of those little communication delays add up, right? So very, very low latency applications may not be a good choice. Um, so the other one is, the other uh, sort of inherent challenge is this loss of control. And so we had this, when we moved from running our own, you know, having our own bare metal machines in our own data centers, we gave up a little control, moved to the public cloud, right? And then we gave up a little bit more control, moving to a, a serverless architecture. Um, in many cases, the benefits that came along with, with giving up that control were worth it. The trade-off was worth it. Um, in some cases, uh, maybe not. Maybe you do want to have control of that full stack. So, um, and then the last, uh, these last two that I've got listed here, um, we're not sure that those are inherent flaws. They're definitely, uh, they're definitely challenges right now, but we hope they'll improve in the future. So testing, testing serverless applications is certainly difficult, right? Um, but there's a couple of ways to look at it. Uh, on one hand, these are very small components, and so unit testing them is usually quite straightforward. Um, and so we, you know, we have a lot of success exhaustively unit testing you know, little lambda functions. 
Um, on the other hand, end-to-end -end integration testing is extraordinarily difficult, and it's almost impossible to do locally. Uh, it becomes a situation where we advocate things like, you know, if you want to test this serverless application end-to-end, -end, uh, spin up an entire, uh, the entire application and all of its associated infrastructure in a different AWS account, for example. Because uh, there's also, you can also sort of stomp on, uh, on uh, existing resources if you test in the same uh, account that you're using for production. Um, we, like I said, we expect these things to improve. Um, this stuff, I'm going to go over the history just, just briefly, and we'll see how new it is. So we really, as a, as a community and as an industry, haven't really uh, arrived at best practices for a lot of this stuff yet. Uh, although a lot of what we've learned doing microser uh, microservice architectures will help. Uh, tooling is the other uh, sort of challenge right now. So I think the only uh, platform that has a, a good sort of debugging story, for example, where you can actually uh, attach a debugger to a running uh, process and, and look at the, you know, in, inspect the, the, state of the, uh, the state of the process, I think uh, Azure Functions and a Visual Studio integration is the best story for that now. Um, but that doesn't exist for most of the other uh, platforms out there. And the tooling around deployment and around managing sort of big you know, systems of these things uh, is still very raw. We haven't figured out quite the, the right level uh, of abstraction, but we're getting there. So, so fundamentally, serverless is this area of backends as a service and functions as a service. Um, so th that's sort of the, that's like the 20,000 foot view. Um, so let's just briefly touch on why, why would we choose serverless? What makes for some good serverless use cases um, what are some bad ones? What are some good ones? So some really terrible ones, and I've, I've, I've hit a, a few of these, uh, these things already. If you go back to those sort of uh, challenges, so very low latency applications, not a good choice for serverless, right? Um, so you know, something like high frequency trading, uh, we may never see that uh, in this type of architecture. Uh, large scale in memory stateful things, uh, those problems that you're trying to solve that just require tons of memory uh, and, are, and are super stateful. So, also not good choices. Uh, long running stateful uh, processes are also not good choices. These just sort of run up against some of these inherent limitations uh, in serverless components, especially functions as a service components. So on the flip side of that, what are some marvelous uh, serverless use cases? So this first one here is actually, this is an area where I've got a, uh, had quite a successful experience uh, doing, uh, building a system that was using uh, AWS Kinesis and Lambda to do billions of events a day, terabytes of data, um, but the, the, the attributes of that system that made this successful with a serverless architecture was that it was tolerant to some latency uh, and it was asynchronous. So this is data coming in, being processed and going through a pipeline and then eventually ending up uh, in, in a storage system. Um, so that was a great use case. Uh, latency tolerant uh, synchronous uh, application. So if you're backing a web, you know, like a web API or a mobile app or something like that, when I say latency tolerant, I don't mean latency of minutes. I, I mean latency of you know, tens or hundreds of milliseconds being acceptable. Um, another great use case, and, and this is actually where, this is sort of the gateway drug for serverless for a lot of people, is gluing little pieces of infrastructure together, or little, little you know, operations processes or, or uh, you know, orchestration. Um, so you know, examples of this might be uh, in cloud formation. You can, you can call out to a, a Lambda function to do a little bit of logic and, and, and uh, you know, put that into your, your, uh, your infrastructure automation. So the other thing I want to mention is, so we talked about, so the bad serverless use cases and the good ones. Um, don't be afraid of hybrid architectures either. These are okay. There's not, there's not a one size fits all answer. And so for example, um, this, you know, this is a, this is a very uh, abstract example, but if you had API gateway and Lambda, so those are both what we would consider serverless uh, components. Uh, and then RDS, which, which is not. Um, people do this all the time. The thing you have to be careful of, uh, just like you have to be careful of this in any, uh, you know, like a microservices architecture, is that different components have different properties, especially properties of scaling. So it's very easy for components that scale very quickly and very wide to overwhelm components that don't. Uh, and so there, there are strategies for dealing with this. Um, but the point I just want to make here is that it doesn't have to be all one or the other. If some parts of your problem are best solved by a non-serverless component or piece, then investigate ways you can use that because it's, it's, it's probably doable. So, cool. All right, so that's, like I said, that's a sort of 20,000 foot view in some of the use cases. So let's dive into AWS Lambda.
cool. So at a glance, so we've talked about functions as a service, uh, uh, you know, sort of one of these, one of the, one of the two technical, uh, uh, you know, sides of serverless in general. So this is a functions as a service platform. It's built in 100 millisecond increments. So one of those, those traits of serverless things is that, is that uh, we, we scale and we, we bill in very granular, very elastic, uh, in a very granular and elastic way. Uh, so it has these runtimes available for it. We're gonna talk mostly about the Java runtime, which we can use Clojure with, uh, and then also Node, Python, uh, and interestingly, C Sharp, uh, so you can sort of tell where Amazon thinks the competition is. Um, it's event-driven, uh, and so uh, all of these integrations that Lambda has with other AWS services, most of those are happening in the form of events coming in to the Lambda platform. Um, or you can call an API, you can just say, hey, hey, invoke you know, this function with this data. Uh, and it's got these synchronous and asynchronous invocation patterns. So you can invoke a function and wait for the response to come back, or you can invoke it and then just, it, it just goes on its way. So, cool. Uh, briefly about the history. So I was surprised uh, putting these slides together. I thought Lambda was like a few years old at this point. It's like two and a half. Um, I've been excited about it for what feels like forever, uh, but it's really not that old. So we got, uh, we got Node.js, a gig of memory, and 60 seconds worth of runtime uh, back in November 2014. Uh, a year later, we got uh, a Java runtime and perhaps not uh, coincidentally more memory. Um, and then we've gotten steady improvements in the, since then. So API Gateway is a huge enabler of this stuff to back you know, mobile apps and APIs and things like that. Uh, we got Python, more runtime in October 2015, VPC support, versioning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna have time to go into all of these things and there's even more now uh, that I haven't put on uh, the slide because it's just, you know, every couple of weeks we get a new feature with either the Lambda platform specifically or some of the things around it. So uh, speaking of the things around it, I wanted to just touch on the rest of, and this is not the rest, this is a sampling of the AWS serverless ecosystem. So these are pieces that play well with Lambda. Um, well, so obviously Lambda plays well with itself. Uh, API Gateway, so an interesting thing is things like DynamoDB and S3 SNS, SQS, these are, these are services that have been around for longer than we've been using the word serverless, right? So these have those properties of, you know, really elastic scaling. We're not talking about host instances. We're not provisioning things in terms of machines, right? Um, so those all play really nicely and are, are a great part of many serverless architectures. We're not, get, unfortunately, we're not gonna dive deep on anything other than Lambda today, but these are out there and there's plenty more, so cool. All right, so the Lambda runtime environment, um, if anybody's used it before, you're familiar with this. This is irrespective of the language runtime you choose. So this is the, the environment that's available for any Lambda function. Uh, so right now you get between 128 megs and 1.5 gigs of memory. The minimum CPU speed and IO scale accordingly to that. And I'm gonna show you a really weird graph later that's gonna explain why I chose the word minimum there. Um, you get two virtual CPUs, 500 megs of temp space. There's some limitations on the size of the, the code artifact that you can upload to the platform. Uh, and then standard out and standard error go to CloudWatch logs. And like I said, if we have some time at the end, I'll talk a little bit more about CloudWatch logs. So cool, so this is all publicly available. This is what's documented. This is what's out there you know, for you to just sort of, um, you know, for you to see. But if we peel back the curtains a little bit, um, so there's been some work done in this area by, uh, by people that are curious. Uh, so there's a company called IOPipe uh, that have done a lot of introspecting of the containers that Lambda functions run in. Uh, they have a monitoring solution for Python and Node.js. Um, but so, so behind the curtains, Lambda is, is container-based. So um, it's LXC containers. Uh, those containers are created on demand. So when you, you, know, when you uh, create a Lambda function and you invoke it for the first time, or it is invoked for the first time, that container is created. Uh, with your code in it. The, uh, I'm gonna go into more detail on this when we talk more about the, the, the Clojure Lambda specifically. Uh, but basically the minimum lifetime of that container is five minutes. So if you hit it once uh, and then don't do anything else with that Lambda function, that container will stay alive for about five minutes. Uh, the maximum container lifetime, interestingly, uh, is four plus hours. For, um, for a long time, the, the community thought it was just four hours uh, until very recently we've seen some much longer lived containers. So what that means is that if you invoke a Lambda function, it brings up the container. Uh, if you're regularly uh, invoking that function, that same container will stay warm for several hours. 
Um, another interesting property is that uh, containers can be snapshotted. This is snapshotted after they've been initialized. So a container starts up, it loads your code, your code goes through whatever initialization that it needed to do. We'll talk more about those steps. Um, that can actually, that can be snapshotted and set aside. And then if another request comes in later, uh, and it, the, the platform can take that snapshot and sort of rehydrate it and, and use it. Um, that means that you're not necessarily going through the same reinitialization process, but if you did things like open network connections to databases, um, you can have issues there. So it's something to be aware of. Um, so we talked about, we're talking about sort of containers being created. And so that's, it's got kind of a, a word that has a, a lot of negative connotations with it, and that's cold starts. Um, so container cold starts are sort of like the, the big gremlin of, the, uh, of the, the serverless and functions as a service and specifically Lambda uh, world. Um, so I want to explain what goes on in a container with a cold start, and then I'll, I'll talk about what goes on in the JVM with a cold start. So like I said, the Lambda platform receives an event that container is instantiated with whatever code you've configured to, you know, to be attached to that Lambda function. The language runtime is initialized, and then whatever process it has to go through to load your code and initialize your code, uh, that takes place. And then finally, the last step is your handler function that you've configured in the AWS console is invoked with whatever your event data is. So that, those are the steps that a container goes through when it uh, cold starts. So what, what causes these cold starts? What causes these containers to be created? Um, so obviously the first invocation, so if you created a new Lambda function, you invoke it for the first time, you go through all those steps. Uh, if you change the code or change the configuration, uh, the platform's gonna say, well, you changed something, so let me, let me get rid of all those old containers and not you know, invoke them anymore and create new containers representing this new code or configuration. Uh, if the concurrency that your, your Lambda function uh, needs to handle whatever you know, whatever's going on in the, in the rest of the platform, uh, if that increases, so it's creating more containers to handle more concurrent uh, operations. So each of those containers that's created undergoes a cold start as well. Um, and then there's this idea of container reaping. So we talked about a maximum lifetime uh, for these LXC containers. And so at some point, the platform will just decide, you know, hey, this container has been around for four, year, or, <laughs> four years, uh, four hours, I'm gonna kill it and start a new one for the next request. Cool. So I promised a, a really crazy graph and, and what this is gonna show, I, I, I feel like I have to explain it before I show it, otherwise people get kind of sucked in. Um, this is gonna show that the, what's documented as far as uh, relative performance of lambdas uh, based on the memory configuration is the worst case. So here's the crazy graph. So what this is showing, this is, this is the same uh, simple benchmark, it's just a simple uh, Fibonacci benchmark running over about 48 hours and it's the same code running just with different memory settings. So 128 megs, which is the sort of least uh, you know, powerful Lambda, up to 1.5 gigabytes, which is the most powerful one. And so, so this, is, this is weird looking, right? Uh, the performance is all over the place. So this is the, the duration in milliseconds that that benchmark takes to run. So lower is fast, higher is slow. So in this highlighted section right here, hopefully everybody can see that, um, this has things spaced out the way, that, the way that it's documented, right? So that 128 meg lambda is the slowest one. And then at, at just the right steps, proportional to the memory setting, we improve the performance, right? And so that 1.5 gigabyte lambda is, is the fastest. So cool, so that makes sense, that's what's documented. This is, this is the worst case. Um, what's interesting is that sometimes uh, the performance can be much, much better. Um, and so in this case, the, you know, the 128 meg lambda and the 256 meg lambda are running at about the same speed, which is actually also you know, very close to the one gigabyte and the, five, the 512 is in there. And uh, you know, none of those are, are much, you know, are very far off of the 1.5 gig. Um, so, so what's going on here? Sorry, let me just scroll my notes. Whoop, cool. So what's happening here is that these containers in this worst case situation, those are containers that have been scheduled on, on a host instance on the platform that's already loaded, right? So it's just adhering to whatever the minimum guarantees it needs to to make sure everybody gets the, you know, the amount of CPU that they paid for. But if a container is scheduled on a very lightly loaded host instance, it can use more resources than it's necessarily uh, you know, had allocated. 
And then as things, you know, as things move around, uh, you know, the performance will change. So what's happened over here on the right side is that, and, and some of this is speculation on, on my part, but is that each of those separate lambda functions is in a different container, probably on a different host instance that probably doesn't have much else uh, running on it. So they're able to take advantage of that performance. Now, memory, like raw memory usage does not work like this. If you exceed the amount of memory that you've configured for the Lambda, you get killed. Uh, but CPU performance does have this, uh, this interesting variation. So two takeaways from this graph. Uh, takeaway number one, benchmarking Lambdas is, is, is hard. Um, if you're benchmarking a Lambda just by running it a few times in succession, and it's not the 1.5 gigabyte memory setting, you might get badly wrong information, right? So you could benchmark, you, you, could, you could run a, uh, the 128 meg lambda, the lowest powered one, you could run that 10 or 30 or 50 times in a row and think, wow, this, thing's, this thing is performing great. Uh, and then when you run it in production a day later, it's 10 times slower. So uh, the other point is that in addition to the performance that you're paying for with the, the 1.5 gigabyte Lambda, uh, you're also paying for consistency, right? So that's just, that's going to be the most consistent performance that you're gonna see. And I, I think I missed, the explain, I missed explaining this earlier. Uh, Lambda is built in those 100 millisecond increments and then memory is a multiplier of that, right? So you're, you're paying by the gigabyte second, essentially. Cool. So we've, we're 25 minutes in. I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. And uh, let's talk about closure on AWS Lambda. Um, so is anybody in the room running closure on the JVM on Lambda right now in production? Fantastic. Cool. I would love to chat with you guys afterwards and just find out more. Um, great. Whoops, that's not closure. Um, so I wanted to. <laughs> So, so all of the documentation is, uh, is based on Java, so I wanted to start there and then transform this into Clojure so we can sort of see how it goes, right? Uh, this is one of the simplest lambdas you can write. Um, it's, a valid, it's a valid lambda, it's got a class and, and a handler. There are no special AWS libraries required for this. Uh, it's, it doesn't have a special AWS interface, it doesn't have a special AWS super class here. Uh, it's just the signature of that handler um, and it's using, it, it takes that handler configuration and just uses reflection to find this and, and, and invoke it. Um, and this is how you would specify that particular uh, handler in the, in the Lambda console where you configure your Lambda or through the API, you, know, you can also do it there. Uh, the package name, the class name, and then the, the handler. So let's turn this into closure. Um, so a little different, but, but not too bad. Um, it's just a standard gen class. You'll have to AOT compile this. Um, and when you, when you use gen class and specify your method like that, you have to handle uh, two arguments to the, uh, uh, to the function. Uh, one is, is the sort of this that represents the, the, uh, the class, uh, the instance, uh, and then whatever the input is. So yeah, so this is basically the same thing. I think I lowercased the, um, the namespace name uh, to be idiomatic in closure, so you end up with a lowercase class name. So, Cool, so that, that is as simple as it can be. The, you don't actually need anything, anything other than this uh, to run your closure code on the JVM and Lambda. So that's, that's cool. Um, I was, I was uh, you know, I, I think that's great. <laughs> so cool, and, and to deploy that, it's just a simple uh, uh, Uber jar for us, for us you know, JVM uh, programmers and for everybody else is a zip file, and of course, a zip is a jar file, um, so that, that all works fine. Great. Cool, so I'm gonna back up, back out to the runtime just for a minute here and talk about Lambda and the JVM. I promised I would tell you sort of how the JVM uh, you know, handles these cold starts and how to deal with that. Um, and so the first time you think about it, uh, you think, oh, Lambda functions, you know, they're sort of ephemeral, they can come and go, the platform's just gonna do whatever it wants, and uh, I have to handle these cold starts. And so an ephemeral JVM, that sounds like a really great idea, right? Said no one ever. Um, cool. So the, so the JVM runtime, just to run down the stats, so it's OpenJDK 1.8, it's the server VM. Uh, the max heap size uh, is always going to be, at least right now, it's, it's always set to 85% of whatever you've configured the Lambda memory uh, as. Uh, it's overriding the default and using the serial garbage collector. I don't know if that's going to change for, uh, for Java 9 or not. Um, it's using tiered compilation, uh, and it's using class data sharing. Uh, so all of those, 
all of those options are, are well, sorry, those last, those last uh, two-ish options are, are geared towards making cold starts a little less painful. Um, we don't have control over those startup flags. We can, we can inspect them and see what their values are, and so we'll be able to see when they change, uh, but we can't change them, unfortunately. Cool, so JVM cold starts. So this is, you know, we, we've, all, uh, we, we've all seen that the JVM can take a while to start up. This is what's going on. So it's, it's doing class loading. Uh, it's doing any kind of initializations, calling constructors, you know, static initialization blocks. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the case of, you know, for us closure programmers, it's also loading the closure runtime. Um, there's a great section on the closure wiki that's sort of like looking towards the future uh, and talking about ways to make uh, closure startup much less painful and much faster. Uh, lots of gr there's lots of great ideas uh, in there, and hopefully we'll see some of those come out soon. Uh, and then as you run the JVM, it's doing this JIT compilation. So if you're, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, if you leave a JVM up and running, it's going to improve in performance, uh, you know, as it as it runs, especially as you do the same things uh, over and over again. So, so knowing what we know about JVM cold starts. Uh, and how to build the, these deployment packages you know, to load our closure code into Lambda, um, how, do we, how do we make that as fast as it can be? Because keep in mind, we're paying by the 100 milliseconds, right? So any, you know, every time we shave 100 milliseconds off of this, we're actually paying less, um, which is a property you don't get in a lot of systems. So, so this is what I like to call the Lambda diet. Uh, I'm gonna sell an exercise video as well. Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, the, uh, the key here is that fewer classes is a faster startup, right? Um, and again, that entry on the closure wiki, I mean, they, they talk about this at length where they're saying, okay, if you do a simple class in Java, uh, you, you, know, you, have to, you have to load literally one user class. If you do the same thing in, in closure, you have to load, you know, a thousand uh, classes that are, you know, all the closure core stuff and, and so on and so forth. Um, so if we're choosing to use closure, to some extent we, 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 we can't affect that, but we can affect and we do have control over the dependencies that we bring into our projects. And as closure programmers, as Java programmers, um, I know I'm guilty of, oh, hey, I need that one little thing from this library. Let me just dump that in my Lineagen file or my Maven palm. And then, you know, then I look after six months of doing that and my .m2 directory is like 60 gigs or something. Um, so we're used to just pulling independencies when we need them and not really thinking about maybe how big they are or what, uh, what kind of transitive dependencies they bring in. Um, so we need to ruthlessly cull our dependencies. It's not to say you can't have dependencies, it's just that you should be very conscious of what you pull in and why you're pulling it in. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, how to make some of those choices, especially re with regard to the AWS libraries because um, those, are, those are some of the, I used to say, some of the worst offenders, um, it's more like you're, you're often using AWS libraries when you're writing lambdas, uh, and some of them are better than others. Uh, and if you, if you, for example, if you pull in the entire AWS Java SDK, uh, or if you use a library like uh, Amazonica, um, you can easily end up in a situation in which you've got 40 megabytes of dependencies uh, for just a couple of functions, right? Uh, so AWS actually ships a bomb now. This is a little bit more relevant for the, for the Maven users, uh, but that's a way to sort of ensure that you're using the same dependency version across many different AWS SDK libraries. Um, so get, you know, get familiar if you're not already with things like line depths tree, Maven dependency tree. Uh, those let you see dependencies and transitive dependencies so you can be very uh, sort of conscious of what you're pulling in. Um, maybe it's a little bit heretical to mention SBT in this context, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. Uh, it's got a a uh, cool feature called dependency stats, which in addition to, to listing out dependencies and transitive dependencies, it tells you how big they are. And so that's a really useful sort of for saying, wait a second, I'm just using this one little thing, but it's, it's you know, got a dependency on this XML library, which has you know, dependency on something else, which is bringing in you know, 40 or 50 megs worth of stuff. So, um, so be conscious of your dependencies. Uh, unfortunately, as I, we've probably all discovered this, so doing tree shaking in Clojure is, is pretty hard. It's actually pretty hard on the Java side too. There's a lot of dynamic class loading stuff going on uh, on the Lambda platform, and so every time I've tried to optimize a jar and get rid of classes that weren't being used, it inevitably comes around to bite me in the end. So, cool. Um, I talked about, uh, talk about handling input. So one reason that we bring in dependencies is to get, so on the Java side of things, we like to use, you know, it's, it's, it's a statically typed language, so we like to have these typed events coming into our function. Uh, 
And the AWS runtime uh, will actually deserialize JSON into POJOs for us. So that's super cool. If you have a, uh, uh, you know, it'll see that handler uh, function signature. If you've got a POJO there, uh, it, will, it will attempt to take incoming JSON and turn it into that POJO for you. So that's, that's cool and that's super useful on the Java side. But what we often do is we say, okay, I want to handle an event from, uh, you know, Kinesis, for example. Um, Kinesis maybe they might have fixed this by now. Uh, but then, you know, we would say, okay, I actually need to go get the Kinesis uh, SDK library just to get that event POJO. Uh, and then maybe I don't do any other Kinesis operations, but I've just pulled in that entire library to get that one little POJO. Uh, so what we've, uh, what we've been advocating, what we've been doing is actually, uh, especially for the AWS, you know, event sources, uh, go out and find the, that, that library on GitHub, grab the one or two classes that you need, and just put them in your project as source. Um, we're also working on a, on a more comprehensive library that's, that will auto-generate some of those things. Uh, you'll be able to find that on Symfonia's GitHub sometime in the near future. Um, and that'll let us avoid this sort of problem of bringing in these huge libraries just for one or two little events. Um, and the AWS event types are kind of scattered across libraries. There's, there's some that they provide uh, in a kind of condensed form, but oftentimes they're, just, they're in whatever SDK library that, that they're coming from. Um, or the other option, um, and something that makes a little bit more sense, especially in a dynamic language like Clojure, is parse the incoming JSON yourself. Uh, you can actually just, uh, you can specify that handler function as an input stream and do whatever you want with it. Um, and so for us, it's, it's a little bit easier to deal with JSON uh, in that raw form than it is in a language like Java. So, cool. Cool, so let's get into, we've got about uh, five minutes left. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, closure on, on Lambda. So yeah, AOT compile all the things. Uh, that's, we all could have guessed that. So you have to, obviously you have to AOT compile that namespace that contains your handler function um, so that gen class works. And it's gonna transitively uh, AOT compile all, you know, all of the namespaces that, it, that are uh, included there. Um, without going overboard, optimize for some performance. You know, we should all be using uh, warn our reflection to true uh, and, and fix those reflection warnings. Um, there's a couple of compiler options that can help us a little bit. Um, I think these make more of a difference in Clojure Core where they're already used, uh, unless you're writing like several thousand line doc strings in your application code. Uh, these might not make, uh, at least the first one, uh, might not make a huge difference, but it's worth doing, uh, as is direct linking. So, so both of those should result in smaller class files fewer class files, and faster loading. Um, cool, so for closure on the JVM, uh, you, you basically have to use the 256 meg uh, lambdas or larger. Uh, what happens is you get these sort of uh, inconsistent and, and sometimes transient errors about JSON decoding, uh, even just with simple strings. So I just recommend starting at, start at 256. Uh, that's you know, part of the price we, we pay for using closure with all of its rich features. It needs a little bit more memory. Um, be very opportunistic about initialization. So when, when these lambdas cold start, like I said, that constructor's called in Clojure, you know, if you have a def something, that's gonna be part of the static initialization. Um, be opportunistic and do, do some work there to set, you, set yourself up to run very quickly later. Uh, but on the other hand, ha handle failure really gracefully. So if you're doing some static initialization, you set up like a, a client to talk to a database, uh, don't ignore errors when you then go try to use that client. Uh, you know, catch your errors, maybe reinitialize the client if you have to during the course of the Lambda's execution. Uh, so just handle those things gracefully. Um, you can have multiple Lambda functions per closure namespace, um, and that's a great uh, approach if they share dependencies and they share that sort of initialization and setup. Um, the, the thing you have to do then, though, is you have to redeploy that same jar for each of those Lambda functions. So if, if one function uses some dependencies and one uses another, um, rather than deploying the sort of combination of that to, you know, several times to the Lambda platform, break them up and deploy each one specifically with what it needs. Cool, so this is a little bit more of the, uh, oh man, I'm sorry about that blue there, it's hard to read. Um, so this is a different take on the, on the uh, handler function. So if we use static there, we don't have to handle the sort of instance uh, uh, variable coming into our handler function, so we just get to, to deal with the input. Um, this is just showing that, you know, that def is going to happen when, when the uh, Lambda uh, cold starts and initializes your, your uh, code. So we're doing our expensive initialization there. 
and we're doing some operation with that client that we initialized, but we're dealing with whatever errors came out of it. So this is, and this is all pseudocode, um, but you get the idea. Cool. So I mentioned closure startup time improvements. Uh, Java 9 is going to have a little, some, some small performance enhancements, nothing, uh, at least in my sort of glance over what's coming in Java 9, nothing stood out to me. Um, obviously, Project Jigsaw is a whole other uh, area, and um, the initial, you know, if that, when that comes initially, everything's going to still uh, sort of continue to work as it does now. Uh, but if, uh, for example, if the Lambda runtime changes to prefer that over Uber jars, then we're going to have to rethink how we build these deployment packages. But I'm not going to go into uh, too much more detail there. I do want to talk about this, though. This is closure or closure script. Um, and so, like I said, we're sort of lucky. We get to choose. Do we want to run closure on the JVM on Lambda, or do we want to run closure, sorry, closure on the JVM on Lambda or closure script on Node on Lambda? Um, so I did a little benchmarking. These are naive benchmarks, but this is, this is sort of the setup. Um, and so this is a short benchmark. This is, this is that uh, sort of a similar little Fibonacci uh, benchmark, closure versus closure script. So what's interesting here is that we see, I've marked here the cold starts. Uh, and this is, I think this is about 18 or 20 hours worth of data. So we got three, starts for the, three cold starts for the closure lambda, and those are those top ones. So in this, in this short benchmark that doesn't take very long to run, um, closure on the JVM, as, as sort of as we expect, takes longer to go through that cold start process than closure script on Node. Um, so if this is our application profile and we're sensitive to the occasional cold start and, and, and you know, slower performance in that case, then maybe we would choose Node here. Um, here's the sort of the stats on that. Um, so the, the average duration of that function execution is hard to see in the graph, uh, but was, was about twice as fast for closure on the JVM. But again, it's that max duration, that cold start, where closure script certainly has the advantage in this benchmark, uh, and it's a little bit more consistent as well, again. Um, but overall, closure's, closure is faster here. Um, but when we, when we uh, increase the number of iterations of that benchmark, and we bump it up and so we get longer runtime, let's see what that looks like. And so in this case, it's really just no contest. Um, this is that same Fibonacci benchmark, but with an outer loop of, I don't know, 10 or 50,000 you know, iterations through. Uh, and we see that even when closure is cold starting, closure on the JVM is cold starting, it's still, it's still uh, you know, far better than the closure script, uh, you know, similar version. So uh, in this case, if this, is, if this is sort of what your application ends up looking like, and this is over like 40 something hours, uh, and I'm not going to try to explain all the little, uh, the sort of sawtooth pattern uh, there. A lot of that can be ascribed to the platform, some of it can be ascribed to the runtime, um, but I, I think we'd, we'd all go crazy if we tried to dig into every little, uh, every little flip of the graph. Fundamentally though, uh, closure was well ahead uh, in that benchmark. Um, yeah, so like, yeah, like four times faster. Uh, and in no case was, uh, was a closure cold start slower than the fastest uh, closure script uh, operation. So, cool. And so this is just, this is sort of like my quick take on how to choose between the two. So if you, if you have plenty of volume, uh, so you're keeping a Lambda function warm, um, you should almost always uh, you know, choose, uh, choose closure on the JVM, all, all other things being equal. Um, if you don't have a lot of volume, so you're, gonna, so you're seeing more cold starts, you know, or cold starts are a greater percentage of the invocations of your Lambda function, and you're sensitive to latency, so you really, you know, you would actually prefer uh, less latency on average and less standard deviation from that latency, then closure script's actually probably the better choice. Um, if you have low volume but aren't that sensitive to latency, then it's kind of a toss up and you know, use what you feel comfortable with. Fundamentally, this is, this is all things being equal. If you have a preference for closure script or closure uh, and you have other reasons, then you know, evaluate those in the context of what you're doing. So, cool. Um, so I'm, I'm already four minutes over, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dive into logging and metrics. Uh, there is a version of this talk uh, online that's on the Symfonia webpage uh, that has a video link to a Java SIG presentation that goes into a little bit more detail on the logging and metrics. Um, I did want to flash, whoops, yeah, this was going to be good too. Sorry, I'm trying to get to the, 
Cool. So that's the, that's the TLDR, uh, serverless. Uh, it's evolutionary. It's FAS and BAS. It's great for web apps, data pipelines. Keep your lambdas skinny and warm. Uh, mostly use Clojure on the JVM, and, and it's going to continue to get better as, as we get new versions of Clojure and new versions of uh, Java. Um, and then the, uh, that's, the, that's the one sentence of what we skipped over, is use real logging and scalable metrics. Um, and then here's some resources. A lot of this was pulled from stuff that we've already got out there. Um, and we have a very um, sort of uh, very mellow and informative newsletter if you're, if, if you're interested in uh, serverless in general uh, and AWS and, and Java serverless uh, specifically. So cool. Thank you very much.